tubes. Lavender is our next set of tubes. One of the things you'll notice is lavender, pink, and uh, royal blue are part of a family of tubes. And I like to call this a family of tubes because they all share the preservative K2 EDTA. Okay, K2 EDTA is, is a preservative that you'll find in lavender pink and in royal blue. So I'm going to pass out some lavender tubes to all of you, and I want you to look at these. Some are 3 mLs, some are 10 mL tubes. Go ahead and uh, take a look at these, pass these around. Those are our lavender top tubes. And you see here that we also have pink. So here's some pinks. And if you take a look at these, okay, you'll see that they share a similar additive. sheets out. Uh, lavender goes to hematology. Pink goes to blood bank. And royal blue is toxicology. Yeah, I'm just passing those out so that you can take a look at them so you can see what the preservative is. And I want you to notice the royal blue as well. Uh, the royal blue too. Now, notice that this is the order of draw, lavender pink and royal blue. And they all pretty much share the same preservative, which is K2-EDTA. In your lab sheet um, that we were looking at with the columns, you'll see on the very far right-hand column, you have hematology. That's all lavender, and you'll see that the L is next to each of the tests. Typically, on your lavender, we do what we call a CBC with diff or a hemogram. And the CBC with diff and or hemogram includes um, a series of tests that's, that are done on the blood. So if we want to look at what your hemoglobin is or your hematocrit or we want to look at what your erythrocyte sedimentation rate is, ESR. We want to see what your reticulocyte count is. We're going to use a lavender top tube. This will tell us our white blood count, our WBCs, our RBCs, our red blood cells, our white blood cells. It's going to give us a pretty comprehensive profile of your blood. Okay, so hemoglobin is a molecule and uh, within the red cell, hemoglobin basically has in the center a heme binding site for iron, usually in the plus two state. And with iron in the center of the heme, iron has a high affinity toward oxygen. So if iron isn't in your hemoglobin, if iron's not in your heme binding site, the porphyrin uh, complex, then how can your blood be oxygenated, right? It can't be. If you don't have iron at the heme binding site, then oxygen's not going to bind to anything. And you'll be tired, you'll be lethargic, you'll be out of breath really quick. Um, so that's, those are signs and symptoms of low iron, okay? Sometimes people are lacking the intrinsic factor in their gut. Vitamin B12 helps to uptake iron into your blood, which is why some people get vitamin B12 shots. But if you're missing the intrinsic factor, then no matter how much, how much iron you take orally, you're not going to get that iron put into the heme binding site. So you have to get like vitamin B12 
shots or you have to get iron injections which can discolor the skin. So anything that we need to find out about your blood cells and how your bones are making your red, you know, your red blood cells, uh, your platelets, generally the overall picture of how your blood is working red cells are working in your body, a CBC with a differential gives us that. Differential simply means that we're looking at uh, overall ratios, kind of like the INR, or the blue top tubes, uh, the international normalized ratio. Um, differential is kind of taking a look at everything in perspective, according to the national average of what the norms are. Okay, so your red blood cells are your are, are made in the uh, flat bones of your body. That's where they're manufactured in the, in the sternum, the parietal lobe of your skull, uh, the, the iliac crest, uh, also uh, in your long bones, uh, especially as children uh, are growing into adulthood. Now, you'll notice that pink goes to blood bank. What happens in blood bank? Well, in blood bank, we do what we call a type of Type and cross means we're going to find out what your blood type is and we're going to cross match it to somebody else's blood that has the same blood typing. As I might have mentioned uh, in a previous lecture, if you pull somebody else's blood, you label the tube before you get into a room as opposed to labeling the tube after you've drawn a patient's blood, and you get Get it, you guys get it mixed up, and it's, so you want to do a hemoglobin and a type and cross and you send out somebody else's blood. If we start to transfuse the wrong blood type, it only takes a few milliliters of that incompatible blood to cause someone to have a reaction, and that could cause a sentinel event. Because mismatched blood types will cause your body to make antibodies against the foreign uh, antigen, okay? Typically, if you take a look at blood typing, we have A, B, AB, and O. Okay, so we do blood typing. Well, we also have to take into consideration uh, the RH factor. So it's not just whether you have the same blood, it's whether you're positive and or negative. Positive and or negative, positive and or negative, positive and or negative. Now, AB is considered the universal acceptor with regard to uh, blood typing. So, universal acceptor, whereas O is considered your universal donor. And if you take a look at each blood type, let's say for A, we have what their hemoglobin level is and depending on what type of blood product they need. 
If somebody's hemorrhaging, then we may just give them whole blood. We may bolus them with, you know, an IV because they may have a gunshot wound, they're losing a lot of blood, so we're just gonna try to replace all the fluids. But somebody with congestive heart failure, uh, somebody whose cardiovascular system is compromised, and let's say they need, we need to give them, uh, you know, uh, red blood cells, we may just give them packed cells as opposed to giving them the whole blood because we don't wanna overload them with too much fluid. So we can break the blood up into plasma, into fresh frozen packed cells, into whole blood. We can, the blood can be divided up. As you saw yesterday in the, uh, in the serum separator tube, the Sonia's blood, right? We, had, we drew the Sonia's blood. You saw what the serum looked like, right? You saw how the formed elements separated from the serum, which of course, if we had the lithium heparin, it would have given us the plasma. Do so you have a question? If you're, if you're positive, you can get positive or negative. Correct. Negative, you can only get negative. Correct. Correct. So AB is considered the universal acceptor because AB positive, you can take everything. You can take mm -hmm. O, you can take A, you can take B. Uh, AB negative, you can take A, B, O, AB, but it has to be negative, right? So what you're saying is if it's A negative or B negative, they could only take a negative and B negative? Correct. Okay. But for the EB, they could take any. Right. Yeah. They're the universal acceptor. Yeah, because my daughter, before she had her liver transplant, they told her that she could take any, you know, any type of. Blood product, so she's probably AB positive. She I is AB positive. You're really? I haven't met anybody AB positive. Do you, do you, does anyone, everyone know their blood type here? I know I'm A positive. I'm o positive. B positive. You are O positive. What are you? B. You're B? Okay, Christina, do you know what your blood type is? Um, I bet the Red Cross has really got your number, don't they? <laughs> You're O. Yes. They're looking for you. Yeah. They're going to hunt you down. So knowing, and you'll read, the, you'll read more about this on the phlebotomy website um, when you log in to the course. Uh, you'll read more about blood typing. I guess the most important thing in, in showing you that hemoglobin and type and cross match is usually the first thing that we do before we transfuse blood or blood products to realize that whenever you draw blood from anyone, you must identify the patient and you must label the blood after you've drawn it at the bedside, which is why the, if I have a patient who has to have a type and cross match and a hemoglobin drawn, I'll draw it myself. Because uh, be honest with you, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, excuse me, of uh, having the uh, phlebotomist actually draw the blood, okay? And you can understand, because only nurses and doctors can transfuse blood in the state of Michigan, not LPNs, it has to be a registered nurse or a physician. And when the blood comes, when we go down to get the blood from blood bank and we bring it up, we only have a very short time before we can actually transfuse it, and we have to check it with another registered nurse or a physician to be sure that we have the right person. But all that falls apart if the phlebotomist submitted the wrong blood. It doesn't matter how much double checks we do. So, and a lot of times when people come in and register uh, as inpatient from a hospital, they don't know what their blood type is. So, you know, even if I'm not sure and I go back and I try to look at the patient's blood type to be sure that this is their blood type, Sometimes I can't find it in the history and physical or their, their previous records. So please be aware of the, uh, yes. Um, so for the um, O, the universal donor, uh -huh. what does it accept, only O? Only O, O only accepts O. O negative can only accept O negative. So you are very limited. If you needed blood, Janine, you could only accept O negative. That's what you are, right? You're O positive, so you can take O positive A, B, A, B, and O. Negative or positive? If it's well, A positive. If it's A, B positive, it accepts negative or positive. If it's but negative, you would have to accept negative. Only negative of all the variations. So, so why, why is it called um, universal acceptors? Don't they, the other ones accept? No, because A can only 
only accept A. B can only accept B. So, but A, B, see, A can only donate, A, a can only accept A. But so if I'm, if I'm A positive, I can only get A positive or A negative. Right. If I'm B positive, I can get B positive or B negative. But if you're negative, you can't, you only yeah, can get negative. You can only get negative. Okay. But they accept from the O. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I can accept uh, O positive. Only or positive. Or O negative, negative actually, if I'm positive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. O is the universal donor. Right. So I can accept O. Right. O brother positive. Brother. O positive. Right. My brother or, or, or negative positive. if I'm O. And if he I'm donated A once to Red, uh, the Red Cross. Red Cross. He gets like 50 calls a day. You know how much they want his blood. <laughs> Nick, you're not going to give any blood. What is he? O positive. O positive. Wow. Cool. Alrighty. So let's take a look at Royal Blue for toxicology. Toxicology in the sense that we're looking for metals. And this is why we're going to take a look at the uh, additive potassium 2 EDTA. Metals that don't belong in our body. Calcium, does that belong in our body? Yes. I mean, yeah, yes. sorry. Okay. Uh, sodium, potassium, chloride, does that belong in our yeah. body? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the periodic table of elements. Magnesium? Yeah. Yes. Manganese? No pool? Manganese? Yes. No. Well, manganese? What's manganese? Anyway, I never uh, even heard of that. Oh, well, it's, yeah. an, it's an element. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, it's not common, but, you know, I'm not sure if manganese is, is, is an element in our body. I know we have nickel and we have gold. We have about 75 cents of trace elements if you just break us down into trace elements. I mean, we have all kinds of elements, but typically elements that are normally found in our body that work to, you know, produce enzymes and make, you know, enzymes, proteins, etc. Metals like cadmium, mercury. <clears throat> Are those in our bodies? No. No, cadmium is uh, actually can be radioactive. Mercury is dangerous, right? It used to be found in the thermometers, the mercury thermometers, right? You don't want to have mercury or, or uh, nickel cyanide that you find in electroplating factories. So if somebody is poisoned with a toxic metal, royal blue can be used. For instance, lead. PB. Lead PB, it doesn't make any sense that PB is lead, but PB is plumbum, and it's a very archaic name for lead. And they've never changed it on the periodic table. I don't think Mendel changed it. It's been, the periodic table has been changed every couple of hundred years with new ad, ad elements that are added, of course, new elements that are discovered. So if someone steps on a nail. So, okay. You need a tetanus. Tetanus? Yeah. A tetanus shot? Yeah. To prevent lockjaw? Yes. Right? So will you have to do they draw blood? No. Not necessarily. Not if, if you, you step on a rusty it. nail. There's probably not enough of the rust is uh, iron oxide. That's what rust is. Test for the toxicology. You would do the test. Yeah. To prevent I you. But you wouldn't have to. You'd have to have some acute exposure. Typically, acute exposures related to the royal blue for toxicology, uh, okay. or chronic exposure for children that are ingesting lead paint, mm -hmm. consistently eating lead paint. Um, cadmium and mercury are more found industrial accidents, acute exposure, something blew up, something spilled, somebody, you know, and then we're going to draw blood. So typically with lead, you can actually draw, you can actually use either a royal blue tube or a lavender tube to do a lead look. Because you see lead and iron are kind of similar, even though lead has a higher density. Lead, I think it's a molecular weight of like 98 Whereas uh, iron is 55.86 gram per mole, so the, the density of lead is greater. However, the, uh, the affinity to oxygen.
oxygen. I should say the affinity to the heme binding site is greater with lead than it is with iron. So lead kind of kicks the iron out of the heme binding site, but doing so, lead doesn't really have an affinity to oxygen. So in place of the heat, the iron in the heme site, you've got lead that doesn't have a high affinity to oxygen. So children that continually ingest lead-based paint or some form of lead become anemic because they don't have the iron in their heme to bind to oxygen. So we have to get rid of that lead. How do we get rid of that lead? By giving the little guys intramuscular injections of EDTA. So this brings me back to this additive. EDTA is what we call a chelating agent. A chelating agent. Chelating means it grabs and it binds. And this has a very high electronegativity that binds to positive molecules such as metals without, of course, the potassium, the K2. So if you just inject EDTA intramuscularly, it'll bind those positively charged metals and bind to it and then excrete it through the kidneys, through the renal tubules. It tries to make the molecule ready for excretion. Okay, so grabbing the salts? Well, it, it grabs it and attaches it and then filters it out through the kidneys. So EDTA is pretty cool. A uh, couple of things that uh, I'd like to mention about uh, EDTA, it, it stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. It's a rather simple molecule, but it's highly specialized in that it's got a very high electron uh, uh, affinity. Well, it's highly electron dense, so it attaches to very positive uh, elements molecules, especially your elements like lead that shouldn't be in your body. So a lot of times we'll give EDTA for, uh, to help people that have uh, lead or any type of uh, metal-based uh, poison. We also can use, you know, you can use gas flame chromatography to find out what the, the concentration of a particular element is in the body. Uh, that doesn't really necessarily belong there. Uh, EDTA is probably the secret ingredient in palm olive dish washing liquid. Probably some uh, base as well. But have you ever taken a can of uh, chickpeas or kidney beans or uh, just canned beans and you've noticed kind of it's got a slimy, frothy, yeah. mm -hmm. never stops foaming? Mm -hmm. That's EDTA. And the reason they put EDTA into cans of beans that don't have very high acidity is to chelate the aluminum or the tin from the insides of the can to keep it from going into the beans. So those people that don't wash their beans and just empty it right out in there, you're also ingesting any tiny metal ions that have uh, that have uh, sloughed off through the can. Okay. So wash, wash the beans. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's the um, same reason why they say cook uh, food in cast iron. Is it a, a certain? You know, they used to say cook in cast iron because it was a source of iron. Yeah. How was that? The iron would actually come off and go into the food. It would they actually it was a source of the, iron. For the anemic people. Ca cast iron, yeah. You could cook in cast iron because some of the iron would come off and go into the food and go into you. Iron is iron. The iron in your heme is no different than the iron that we use in, in engineering. It's iron, just like electrons. They're no different in your body than they are in electrical engineering. Okay, electron so is an electron. Saying, when you open a can of chickpeas, okay, yes. you're supposed to Put them in the water first and clean them, and then you have to wash them. Yeah, wash them. Okay. Wash them until all that that, that, that froth yeah. comes off. Cans. Well, yeah, you should. Yeah. But but the reason that they put EDTA, you can read it in the can. Right. Preservative EDTA is to keep is to keep the 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 aluminum, the aluminum cans or the t 
tin from, from uh, you know, diffusing into the beans itself. This way it stays bound to the EDTA and doesn't go into the beans. So by eating, by, by eating the, 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 the uh, liquid in the can, you're actually ingesting the, the, the aluminum ion. And of course, they've linked aluminum to uh, adjusting aluminum to Alzheimer's. So it's one of the reasons that they they uh, you know they still use aluminum chlorhydrate in most of your deodorants, but you can get deodorants now that are um, you know crushed silicon-based natural deodorants. So some, certain things you want to look at. That's why they say try not to drink out of cans cans of soda, etc. So EDTA, K2 EDTA, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. So lavender, pink, and royal blue in the order of draw. Pretty simple. Um, and other than lavender, pink and royal blue are pretty straightforward. Pink is for type of crossmatch, and royal blue is for toxicology, right? Now we're left with one other tube that we have to look at, which is gray. And gray is for glucose and or blood alcohol levels. So let's take a look at our last two in the order of draw, other than the white that we mentioned for infectious disease, or the pearl tube. Gray. Gray. It's, it's gray. Um, gray top tube right here. The, I'll pass a couple of these around so you can see the gray top tubes. Look at the preservatives. I should say uh, potassium fluoride. No, sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate, I believe. So gray is for glucose. Glucose or fasting blood sugars. Fasting blood glucose levels. And of course, blood alcohol levels can be done in gray tops tubes. What do you want to be aware of when you prep the skin when using a gray top tube? I'm not using what? Alcohol. Why? Because you're taking a blood alcohol level, it'll raise blood level. It'll raise, it could feasibly raise the blood alcohol level, right? So this poor guy that's uh, incarcerated, they want to have someone come in and draw a blood alcohol level. The phlebotomist goes into the you know, jail, and they scrub the area with alcohol, well, they've just, they've just put him over the limit now. He's, he's going to be in the slammer a while. Uh, glucose, alcohol will also elevate glucose as well. Okay, because alcohol and, uh, and the sugar molecule, not a whole lot of difference, except in the amount of uh, carbons. Right? So, uh, for gray top tubes, keep in mind, never use alcohol to clean the site. Any questions on that? So blood alcohol level, you can actually draw blood alcohol levels in red serum separator tubes for the medications. Um, but I'd say typically most of my students and people that are out there use gray. Uh, again, the preservatives are the additives for gray. Additives are sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate. Okay, that's those are the two preservatives in, in the uh, in the gray top tubes. So some people teach tubes according to preservative, which you should know, obviously. Uh, I think it's important to be aware of the colors as well. The colors of tubes will help you. Uh, you saw with the serum separator tubes yesterday, they can be, they can have silicon gel in them or they can be sans silicon gel. Uh, plasma separator tubes are your stat greens, which can contain lithium heparin and or sodium heparin. Uh, and that's pretty much the tubes. Uh, we're going to omit the gray and the black because a lot of hospitals don't use gray. Some do, some don't. Uh, gray and black are interchangeable with your uh, K2 
2 EDTA is with your uh, uh, toxic metals, etc. And then I guess it's just the preference of the hospital that you work at. But that pretty much sums it up. And you only will you choose the amount of tubes based on the, uh, the department that and the family of tests that are used. So anything that has to do with hematology is lavender. Anything that has to do with blood banking is pink. Anything that has to do with metal toxicology is royal blue. Any, met any serum separator to test or any metabolic test that would normally be done in a serum separator tube that is that is done in green. You only use the green tubes for your metabolics. So in your lab sheet, your columns one through five, all those are serum separator tubes, right? If any of those were stat, I would use a green. And I would be careful which green I choose so as not to elevate falsely the sodium levels, right? If I, was, if I had a test that I was looking for sodium. But if you have a stat CBC or you have a stat type of cross, all you're going to do is put a stat sticker on those. And you can't make up the stat sticker. You can't decide if something's stat. A doctor has to write the order. For instance, if I think something should be stat, I will run it stat, but then I have to call the doctor and ask him to give me an order for that stat. So, for instance, cardiac enzymes and troponin levels, a lot of times those are stat. If someone comes in, presents with possible myocardial infarction, we're going to start them uh, with an IV. Uh, we'll probably give them some aspirin. We'll probably give them nitroglycerin. We'll give them morphine for pain. We'll hook them up to an EKG machine have the crash card on standby, and the doctor will probably order a stat cardiac enzyme profile. You'll come down with your green top tube, with the lithium heparinized tube, not sodium. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the first muscle protein that is released into the bloodstream when any type of cardiac ischemia takes place, which is myoglobin. Myoglobin typically doesn't last in the body very long. So it's very crucial that the phlebotomists come down to do those stat cardiac enzyme profiles, the stat. And then we'll do a series of troponin levels. Troponin is another muscle protein that if someone's had a heart attack, the body will release, and it, and it gradually increases over time, then that usually indicates to the physician that this person indeed suffered some type of cardiac ischemia. Okay, then we'll probably uh, do an echo. We'll check what the ejection fraction is uh, based on hospital protocol. If the ejection fraction is, is too low, then they're going for a cardiac catheterization. Okay? And then from there, they'll determine whether or not they need a bypass or a cabbage. They're a candidate for that. Well, that kind of sums up the tubes. There is a uh, form. Uh, sure if you have this or not, but it's a, uh, it's a practice sheet, and uh, I'd like to go over this probably after lunch uh, on the order of draw. So you have some familiarity with how many tubes to pull and what the order of draw is now that you have a general working knowledge of, uh, of tubes. Okay? Do you have any questions for me at this time? Um, can I get um, a new copy of the book? Yeah, sure you can. Because uh, I kind of both punched it and I kind of both punched that. Uh oh. Okay, so, yep, yep. You can absolutely sheet. do that. I may have some lab sheets up here. So, uh, Dave, we're going to.